Hi everyone, welcome to the Immigration.ca live stream series. My name is Andrea and I'm here with immigration lawyer Colin Singer. Colin is managing partner of Immigration.ca in Canada. Today we're going to start off by discussing some recent developments in Canadian immigration news, followed by some questions that we received from you. As always, we love hearing from you, so please do feel free to communicate with us in the comments below. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're going to be speaking for about 15 to 20 minutes with regards to the latest developments in the immigration news. And if you have any friends that you find might be interested in this live stream, please do feel free to share it with them. Well, Colin, should we get started? Let's do it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Well, there's been some very interesting developments that have taken place uh, in the industry uh, in the last week. Um, perhaps one of the uh, interesting topics that came to uh, our mind was that um, the levels of immigration to Canada were perhaps the highest in uh, close to 100 years, exactly. a little bit more than 100 years. Uh, the Canadian government brought, admitted to Canada, uh, 320,000 immigrants during the period June 1st, 2015 and June 30th, 2016. It represented a 33% increase from the previous year when in 2014-15 there were only 240,000 immigrants admitted. It was the lowest uh, at that time in, in a 15-year period. The most recent numbers show a very big increase. Uh, pe people are, are, are definitely uh, uh, remarking uh, at how this particular government has brought in so many people. Uh, but of course there's a caveat. Uh, it comes on the heels of a really low number the previous years. And it, it perhaps signals uh, that this particular government which uh, came in uh, on a mandate uh, based on immigration, uh, that uh, they're, they're going to uh, bring in a healthy number of managed immigration uh, in the next few years. Um, and our population, uh, interestingly enough, uh, increased uh, to over 36 million, a large percentage of the new population increase, which was 400 and some thousand uh, people uh, added to the population, uh, is accounted uh, by this very healthy number, uh, this record number uh, of immigrants. Um, and and yeah. what, why is that? I mean, well, basically, Canada is an aging population, so we do need immigration for, for economic growth. So therefore, I mean, it's essential that we do have newcomers to Canada to assist us in reaching this goal. And the, the, the difficulty that our policymakers are facing is that the uh, over age 65 now comprises a larger portion than what we call the younger age, under age 15. This is, right. it happened for the first time last summer, yeah. but it's a trend that's going to continue. Uh, our net labor market growth is now predominantly uh, based on, on a healthy number of immigration. Um, senior citizens are growing. Uh, and so this particular government is looking to uh, bring in more immigrants, uh, but managed. Exactly. And they plan on increasing immigration levels over the next three years, but obviously managed, I mean, bringing in skilled, skilled workers, for example. Uh, so, I mean, the target, they, they set high targets and we seem to be on target. And so for 2016, what we've already covered uh, in the past in our writings, and, and today's topic uh, is, is one in which you can find uh, more details uh, on our website under uh, Immigration News, uh, September 2016. Um, but what's interesting is that it comes on the heels uh, of, of, a, of a, a, an interesting article uh, that immigration has traditionally been criticized uh, for driving down wages. Yes. This was an American uh, initiative that, that came out uh, through the writings of a very well-known economist in the U.S., yeah. uh, and he has written time and again that immigration drives down wages. And 
it's just not true, uh, according to many, and according to a very interesting study, and this is our second piece today, uh, in which we call Immigration Myths Busted, in a comprehensive new report, and this report is U.S.-based, but talk about it for a second. I mean, well, this report, I mean, it, it debunks the myth that immigration will drive down wages. Actually, it's proved that in some cases it actually even elevates wages. I mean, it brings also, it's you know, better for the economy, it's good for goods and services, and it's good for the real estate market, uh, it increases entrepreneurship. Yeah, and, and these elements are discussed in this report. It, it was conducted by the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The authors of this report uh, include an individual who uh, is an economist at the famous Cornell's School uh, of Industrial Relations, um, and they have documented many benefits of immigration uh, that help economic growth innovation, entrepreneurship. I wonder whether this particular report that came out uh, very recently, I wonder if in, in some ways uh, the uh, industry uh, researchers were talking to each other because this Canadian report that came out earlier this summer yeah. in which it showed uh, the benefits of immigration in terms of uh, For example, education. It's, I mean, it's also proven that uh, the children of immigrants do succeed more in school than uh, those of Canadian-born parents in the sense that, you know, there are high rates to graduate from high school and go on to university, right. for example. Right, right. Uh, that's one of the main topics. One of the main, and, and basically uh, this report from Canada that came out, uh, it, was, it was in March 2016. We covered it on our uh, website uh, during, uh, sorry, for the March news articles. Uh, but that report called Immigration, Business Ownership and Employment in Canada uh, highlights and documents how immigrants uh, have a higher uh, percentage uh, of business owners than Canadians. So, which in theory would be good for the economy. Exactly, yes. uh, You have immigrants who are coming to Canada and have a higher percentage of business ownership than Canadians. Uh, so you've got, as you pointed out correctly, that uh, the children of immigrants are having higher graduation from high school rates than Canadians. Uh, you have uh, also a study shows, so this immigration myths busted, uh, a U.S. publication, uh, for the, for, I think for the first time in, in such an overwhelming way shows that, no, it, immigration does not drive down wages necessarily. Uh, I think what, what really uh, this all shows, uh, if you calculate the costs of immigration, immigration, it, 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 it has a neutral effect there is cost in bringing people to Canada, but it's the human capital benefit yes. that the economy uh, will receive over a fairly long period of time. So you need immigration. Uh, from a Canadian perspective, we now have empirical evidence that shows. Uh, and there are uh, Canadian naysayers, and I won't even ingratiate them by acknowledging who they are. They know who they are. Uh, who continually write uh, former government employees who left the government uh, 30 years ago and continue to write negative uh, commentaries on how immigration harms Canada. But the latest numbers uh, from Canada and now from the United States uh, are overwhelming that there are many benefits uh, to immigration. Uh, and, and, and really what's alarming is that uh, the working age population in Canada is increasingly being made up by immigration. Exactly. Uh, and the Canadian portion of our labor market is falling yes. uh, steadily. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this storm that's uh, developing. Policymakers have, have, have raised the alarms uh, and, and the government is listening. And how what are they doing about it? I mean, they're... They're, doing, they're conducting lots of polls. They want to see the Canadians' view on immigration. And uh, you know, from the results of the polls, I mean, Canadians are very open-minded, especially with regards to skilled worker immigration. So there is uh, this third piece that we've covered on our uh, site. And again, today's topic 
uh, is a, a review of some really interesting developments in the immigration industry uh, during the past two weeks. Uh, and we've kind of streamed this theme together uh, during our 15 to 20 minute segment that we're going to cover today. Uh, but the third piece talks about how there are studies being, being done. The Canadian government is listening. Uh, and I think what they're trying to do is ensure that their policy plans do not ignore uh, what Canadians are saying. Exactly. Yes. And, and it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be such that all Canadians favor uh, a massive amount of in, in immigration. That, I mean, that's not what's happening. It'd be like that with any country. I mean, it's sure. how you can't have 100% on, on one side, for right. example. Right, right. But, I mean, Canadians do favor, you know, immigration, for example. I mean, they have an open mind, especially when, you know, immigrants wish to, to integrate. You know, they would like to learn the language. They join the workforce. They participate in community activities. I mean, Canadians have a very open-minded view on this. They seem to have an open-minded view, and the uh, takeaway from all of this is that the government... Uh, is listening. Uh, they're putting in plans to bring in a, an elevated level of immigration, but it's managed immigration um, so that uh, we, we, we get all the bases covered. Uh, what, what are the main uh, developments that the government plans to modify? Uh, for example, they want to change the, the, the law so it's easier for international graduates. So once they graduate from a Canadian university, it's easier for them to remain in Canada because, I mean, they have Canadian education, uh, you know, Canadian qualifications, and they're ready to join the workforce. So that's one. That's one. Uh, right. And there's another one in the sense of the family class. They want to make it easier for uh, for those to bring their close family members to Canada. Right. They want to lower the processing times because processing times in some cases can be quite high. They have been. This has been uh, a blemish on our on our immigration policies. Mm -hmm. Is that family class spousal sponsorship applications in some areas of the world ha are taking years. Uh, and and it was a it was a difficult uh, challenge for the former government, uh, which really uh, I think it got considerably worse under the former government. Um, but the current government now has to act. It's it's almost one year since they were elected, mm -hmm. and they have to act. Yes. Uh, they can't just be in favor of economic immigration. They are in favor of rectifying these. Re these, these unacceptable long processing times for, for spousal applications. Uh, and I think, well, we're all hopeful that they're going to, to, to do that. Uh, what people are, are hoping is that uh, it's standardized across uh, the, the, the whole geographic spectrum. Not, no, not just Europe uh, and North American processing times, but also in India, uh, China, the Philippines, uh, where, of course, uh, these uh, posts have the, the highest number of applications. Right. So it becomes difficult for the government to, uh, to work in those areas because the, again, this is just insider information in terms of language and, uh, I, I should say, uh, knowledge, that the processing missions in those areas are challenged. Uh, and the case officers are challenged. But, but really what the government needs to do is give direction to process family class spousal sponsorship, no matter where you are in the world, uh, within a certain time. It could be 12 months. It could be, you know, in that range. Um, and, and hopefully they're, they're going to, to succeed. The overall indication is that Canadians seem to favor uh, the higher levels of immigration uh, of managed immigration. You've mentioned correctly that they're looking to improve the, uh, in the next few weeks, we're hoping to see uh, concrete elements uh, of these new changes uh, that they're going to announce. Uh, family reunification, international students. Um, as well as the technology sector? Technology sector. So we have... A shortage. In a the... shortage in, in many different uh, labor markets of the country yeah. where Canadian technology companies uh, are forced to wait literally uh, six, eight, ten months, yeah. which is untenable in, in the recruitment world. You know, immigration and recruitment go together. Exactly. So if you're going to have an immigration program, it's obvious that uh, it needs to s mirror uh, what, what recruitment uh, it, it aims to achieve. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've always said that immigration minister yeah. is probably 
one of the, if not the biggest, one of the largest recruiters in the world. Yeah. Uh, the immigration minister to Canada, that is, yes. bringing in so many uh, individuals. So we have these changes. Uh, the, 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 the temporary foreign worker uh, program, they're planning to... The lift the limitations as well. They're trying to make changes as, with, as well with regards to that program to make it easier. To make it easier because, again, under that, uh, that former government, uh, we had m very harsh and restrictive changes that were put into place. And I think what this government is planning to do is kind of move the goalposts slightly. They're going to um, make it not, uh, you know, go the other way completely, but to temper down uh, some of the obvious uh, egregious uh, elements of the program that, that really uh, do not benefit Canada overall. So, again, the, uh, oh, the provincial nominee program. And that's oh. already been taken into effect. I mean, so uh, Atlantic Canada w was able to, to actually accept more immigrants. So that's been actually raised. So, I mean, obviously, we have seen um, changes. We expect changes, and changes have already been put in place as well. And, and hopefully some of the provinces who seem to be uh, lobbying for more numbers uh, because in Canada, uh, as we all know, uh, the federal government is the uh, largest player in terms of bringing in uh, a certain number of, of economic immigrants. But immigration in Canada is shared uh, between the provinces, and all the provinces have their own powers. And, and they all neatly blend in now to the express entry system, uh, where provinces can uh, nominate and, and, and how a provincial nominee receives a lot of points. So yeah. the government is, is looking to, to give uh, some uh, effect and give the provinces uh, more uh, selection uh, of immigrants, uh, more numbers. Uh, and we're waiting to see how, how that's going to play out uh, overall. Um, so those are the three uh, main topics, topics yeah. that, we, that we wanted to cover today. Um, and perhaps we might uh, move to take on some, some questions. And sure. is that, does that make sense? Yep. So let's start with the first question. Okay. All right. So this one is from Trolls. And the topic is with regards to moving to Canada temporarily and what to do next. So him and his girlfriend are living in Denmark. And they both finished their master's degrees a couple years ago. And they're interested in Canada. So they're particularly interested in Vancouver because they love nature and a city with a good vibe. Uh, he runs a one-man online marketing agency and can work from anywhere in the world. So, and basically, there's three things I would like. They want to explore Canada uh, for six to eight months. He wants to be able to continue to work remotely. And, uh, I mean, he says he has the financials to support his stay, so he's interested on what kind of visa they do need. Okay. Without d dealing with their nationality, the first thing you mentioned was that they are living in Denmark? Yes. Okay. Uh, and they're looking to uh, visit Canada. What, what comes to mind is for an extended period of time. Yes, for uh, six to eight months. Now, we don't know, we don't know their nationality. Uh, some of these programs that we uh, talk about uh, allow uh, for uh, long-term programs, what we call international student programs, where people under the International Mobility Program can come to Canada. So depending on their nationality, uh, they might qualify for what we would loosely call working holidays. Uh, but typically people from a, a number of countries uh, uh, do not need a, a, a temporary resident visa to enter Canada. Uh, so, but when you do come to Canada, I think that these individuals seem to have, uh, again, without knowing their nationality, uh, if they are from, uh, if they're passport holders or, or uh, permanent residents uh, of a country that has an agreement with Canada, uh, they may not need a, a visitor's visa, what we call loosely a visitor's visa, they may not need an entry visa. Uh, in such instance, they would be able to come and visit Canada uh, for up to six months. And then once they're in Canada, uh, typically individuals uh, could apply for an extension or uh, of time. Uh, you, could, you could apply inside Canada uh, if you're from a, a country that doesn't need a formality, a visa formality to enter the country. 
uh, you would be given six months uh, and you would be able to extend your stay in Canada. If you were interested in staying for a year, perhaps you might change your mind and want to work in Canada. Mm -hmm. We have the International Mobility Program under which there are a number of programs uh, based on, uh, on country mm -hmm. uh, that are participants in this uh, agreement uh, and they could be able to, they would be able to work uh, for a one-year period but those visas go very quickly. So, and if you are from a country in which you need a temporary resident visa to, to visit Canada, uh, then uh, you, you would need to, uh, of course, document uh, what your purpose of visit is, how long you want to visit, and in, in such instance, you would have to prove uh, other elements including uh, that uh, you do not intend to stay permanently. Right. So I think without knowing their nationality, uh, if they're planning to visit Canada, it seems that uh, again if they're from the visa exempt country, uh, they'll, they'll have no difficulty getting a six month uh, entry um, and it's not formally stamped in your passport uh, when you uh, come to Canada. Sometimes they'll, they'll mention must leave uh, and they'll put a six month window. Uh, if they're not, and it's not an automatic that you get six months. You, you have to have uh, at least satisfy the, the examining officer that your purpose would lend itself to a six month window. So right. it, it, it requires a bit of uh, a verification on, on what your nationality is what your purpose of visit is, but for many individuals, there's a, there's a lot of options. Okay, perfect, thank you, Colin. So that brings us to the next question. It's from Macro Megali. He wants to sponsor his wife from Africa. He's a Canadian citizen and studying medicine in the United States without any income. He wants to know how he can meet the income requirements needed to sponsor his wife from Africa to Canada. Okay, uh, well, listen, all these applications are done online and uh, you don't have uh, an income requirement to sponsor a spouse. Uh, you, of course, you want to make sure that there's no inadmissibility issues. Uh, you want to make sure uh, that the Canadian uh, citizen is, uh, did you mention they're in a particular, where are they located now? Uh, he's located in the United States and she's in Africa. Okay, uh, if he's located in the U.S., there's an interesting element to, to, to this um, fact pattern, and that is the Canadian authorities will want to be sure, because one of the conditions of sponsorship is that you intend to reside in Canada. Yes. Right. So if you are working in the U.S. and you want to uh, Canadianize your spouse, which is something that, uh, of course, uh, it's quite reasonable if you're a Canadian and, uh, and South Africa being a country in, in which it's very, uh, uh, it, you need a, a TRV to come to Canada. Uh, so to even visit Canada, you'll, you'll need to apply for a TRV. But to sponsor under the family class spousal, uh, the um, Canadian citizen who's living in the States will want to show evidence that he or she, well, he is, is, is going to permanently reside in Canada. Right. Uh, in some areas of the world, uh, the Middle East, for example, there's a lot of, of, uh, of policy that's been put into place uh, where an individual will have to actually show that they're, that they're leaving their job yes. and that they're tying up their, their, their anchor. They're, they're breaking their anchor, uh, let's say, in the Middle East. Uh, I don't think the U.S., uh, the Canadian uh, counterparts are going to be that harsh with, with, with someone who's in the U.S., uh, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, it's important that you have uh, evidence that you're going to live in Canada, and uh, that, that's, the main, that's the main takeaway. And, and income is not a, an element of, of assessment. So if you don't have the income... Uh, to sponsor, that is not a bar in itself. Right. Okay. Thanks. So this moving on to the third question, that is from Canadiga. It's regarding the financial documents for a visitor's visa. So he's applying for a visitor's visa for his grandmother. He submitted a letter of invitation to her that she can submit with her application. He wants to know how he can send his financial documents to support her application directly to the visa office. Uh, the reason being that he does not want to disclose his financial information to anyone except for CIC, the Canadian government, and his grandmother is elderly. Okay. Uh, well, most of these applications are now done online. So when you make your application, you're submitting them uh, directly to the assessment uh, center, uh, and it's done online. So you, you don't have to worry about uh, how it will be submitted uh, and, and such. 
but it's not, you can't expect to get this documentation back. So you want to be sure before you submit this documentation when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you're, 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 you're not really, the issue of receiving your documents back it doesn't come into play uh, and in terms of who's going to know uh, is really not an issue because you're, you're really dealing and transacting uh, with the Canadian authorities online only. Perfect. And it makes we have time for one more question. Okay. It's from Mauricio35. Uh, he says, I am in the process of finding an employer to obtain an LMIA worth 600 points. I'm afraid as in order to get the LMI approval, it needs to be proven that no Canadians are available to fill the position. Could you please explain? Okay, well that's, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, and that is, you know, it's, it goes to a number of things. First of all, uh, if, you come, if you want to work uh, in Canada on a, on a work permit, uh, to work for a Canadian employer, you need what's known as a labor market impact assessment. Uh, and if you're applying for immigration on a permanent basis to Canada, uh, under the express entry system, well, we all know that uh, getting an employer lined up and suited uh, to sponsor your application and, and obtaining a labor market impact assessment, an, an approved one, brings uh, an additional 600 points to the overall picture. Uh, and, and this individual raises an interesting concept in that one of the elements is, is that the employer must prove that they have canvassed the labor market. And the test is not that no Canadians are available. The test is that the employer cannot find any Canadians. Yeah. And that's an important nuance because, uh, you know, the labor market in Canada is so fragmented. There are so many labor markets. Mm -hmm. And so what the Canadian authorities do is they ensure that an employer has uh, advertised the, the position. Right. It's disclosing the title, the salary, all the working conditions, and that this uh, advertising process uh, is, is for a significant period of time. Um, it, it was two months, uh, one month uh, probably is where the new rules might come down to. Uh, depends on the type of occupation uh, that we're trying to fill. But the test is not that no Canadians are available, it's that the employer cannot locate uh, a Canadian. Now, the wages that must be advertised does not, does not compel an employer to pay the highest wages possible. Exactly. You know, it, it has to be a wage that's within the range of normal wages. So let's take a position where if a Canadian, uh, an average wage for a particular position, uh, as perhaps a Canadian may not be available, but it doesn't compel the employer to pay the maximum wage. We don't have to have a bidding war where it drives up wages yeah. and then there'll be a Canadian available. Uh, what, what really the employer must do is advertise and it's very, it's very conceivable that yes, there may be Canadians available, but at that particular snapshot in time, the employer cannot locate suitable Canadians, and the word suitable means who are willing to take the job at the reasonable salary that's being offered. Right. So, you know, the, the labor market is a very dynamic one. And, and, and at any given time, there are people who are may be available, uh, who may not be available. But the employer, again, the test is not, because it's, it sounds like a scary test to an outsider, yeah. that an employer is, well, there's lots of Canadians available. I mean, we do have an unemployment rate uh, of 7%, but in some areas of the country, our, the unemployment rate is 4.2%. Is, is depends on the occupation and sub-labor markets. Uh, and I'm not talking about necessarily the farthest reaches of the country. So this LMIA that's very important uh, and that some of our clients are receiving yeah. through our own efforts because of the services we offer in, uh, under the express entry is because all of our clients do receive uh, excellent employment search consulting assistance. All of our clients receive that. Uh, so the test that we uh, work with uh, with employers and we, we allow them to understand and we help them understand is that you don't have to pay, you don't have to go into a bidding war uh, and it's very conceivable that on the one hand there may be Canadians available but at that more particular moment in time 
there aren't Canadians to fill this position that's being advertised. And, and that becomes a much more reasonable standard yes. and more plausible in the face of a 7% unemployment rate across the country. Uh, but again, each sub-labor market has its own challenges. Right. So I think that would be uh, how I would approach that particular. No, I agree. So uh, I guess that, I mean, we've covered our, our topics okay. uh, for today. So I guess that concludes our, our live stream for today. Thank you very much for joining us. So we have now covered our fourth uh, live stream. Yes. Uh, the information that we shared, is where, where, it's on our website. Yeah, it can be found on the new section of our website, immigration.ca. And how can people reach us for future? So if you're interested in uh, assessing your eligibility for uh, Immigration to Canada, please go to our website and click on the free online assessment link. Uh, so we'll review your qualifications and we'll get back to you in one to two working days. Okay, uh, social media? Social media, please feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any friends that you find might be interested in watching the live stream, please also do share it with them. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today and we look forward to sharing with you on our next session, which will probably be in two to three weeks time. So stay tuned and have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you.